Hey there, YouTube, it's Mike, your fellow codependent who is recovering from the trauma of having been in a romantic relationship with an untreated borderline. So what we're going to talk about in this video, or what I'm going to talk about in this video, is the question, can you create healthy boundaries in a romantic relationship with an untreated borderline. So, if you're new to the channel, uh, this channel is devoted to uh, non-borderlines who have been or are currently in a romantic relationship with uh, somebody who has um, severe borderline personality disorder. I am not a therapist, I am not a counselor, I am not a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, I am not a mental health professional in any way. I am simply somebody who has escaped a very toxic relationship with somebody who I believe was suffering from borderline personality disorder. And I am simply sharing what has helped me to be in a continuing state of recovery. If you are a borderline and you come to this channel, welcome. Bear in mind, I don't know what it's like to be borderline. I'm doing my best to try and understand simply so that I can keep myself healthy and help other people like me who are not borderlines uh, recover from the toxic effects of being in a relationship with somebody who has that mental illness. I do not equate you with your illness any more than I equate anybody with the color of their hair. It just happens to be something that's part of them. But it is uh, something that um, cannot be extricated from you. All right. So can you, if you are in a romantic relationship with uh, somebody who has borderline personality disorder, can you create healthy boundaries within the relationship? If I'm being honest with that question, my answer would be, I don't know. My experience is absolutely not. My observation with other people is absolutely not. Bear in mind, there is a difference between the mental illness of borderline personality disorder and somebody who has just got deep mental psychological issues. Somebody can be completely sane and have a fully functioning brain and a fully functioning identity and have some major emotional issues, which makes it difficult for them to have healthy functional relationships. But that is a completely different thing than somebody who actually has a mental illness, which prevents them from seeing objective reality when it comes to uh, attachment and intimacy. I came up in the last video with... Um, a phrase I want to continue to use, which helps me separate the soul of the person who happens to have this mental illness and the mental illness itself. And that phrase is uh, being uh, intimacy intolerant in the same way that somebody can be um, uh, in, uh, intolerant. What's that? What is it? Milk has lactose intolerant. Somebody who has a borderline personality disorder cannot digest or process intimacy. That in and of itself is, is not enough because for the codependent who's with the untreated borderline, the way that they respond to their inability to process intimacy is actually very violent and extremely destructive. Um, so... The only way that somebody would be asking the question, um, how can I create healthy boundaries with my borderline boyfriend or wife or husband, is if they are in fact under the control of the mental illness of borderline personality disorder. I, in a previous video, I said that borderline personality disorder is contagious. Somebody responded very violently to that. I don't know who it was. I think it was a borderline because it sounds like an attack on them. And I get that. Borderlines deserve to have love as much as anybody else. They deserve to be in relationships as much as anybody else. 
That's why I said in the beginning, I don't know if it's possible. What I've seen and what I've experienced is no. But I also don't know what can happen in therapy. I have heard from, uh, from therapists whom I don't personally know, but who come across to me as being very trustworthy, that there can be some success. I've also heard that for a lot of people, for the most part, that borderlines uh, are, and this is probably the same with anybody who has some kind of sociopathic issue, borderlines do, you know, they might not be full-on sociopaths, but they definitely have some sociopathic tendencies at the least, um, that people who are sociopathic have the ability to um, you know, go through therapy and say all the right things and do all the right things and it doesn't, doesn't change anything. So it can be very challenging. But I don't know. Um, and if I don't know something, I tell you, I don't know. But I will say that if somebody comes to me and says, yes, I'm in a relationship with a borderline or somebody who I think is borderline and they say they do this, 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 and this. And, and if, they, if they present the pain and the inability to extract themselves from the painful abuse, um, then I would have to say the same thing that no, there's, there's no, no borderlines that you can create. I mean, no, excuse, excuse me, no boundaries excuse me, that you can create. And um, if you do, but you should create boundaries because the moment that you create healthy boundaries, I can guarantee you this, it will either end the relationship or it will begin the process of ending the relationship. The only way to be in a an ongoing, I was gonna say functional, but there's no such thing as a functional relationship with a borderline. Uh, untreated, untreated borderline. Um, the, uh, the only way to have an ongoing relationship, a uh, romantic relationship with an untreated borderline is if you give away your boundaries in destructive ways to yourself. There's just no way around it. There's no middle ground. It's impossible. It won't happen. It just, it just won't. You have to see that as a law. Now, um, again, I only have my experience. I am not a borderline, and no way in hell would I would I want to try and counsel or treat a borderline because I have no idea what the hell they need. Um, the illusion, it's the delusion that the codependent has that if we can just show them their behavior, if we can just show them how it's affecting me, if they can finally understand it, if we can just show them what they're missing out on, you know, the whatever, fill in the blank. If we can just get them to see and realize is a delusion. Because even if you could get them to see and realize and know, fill in the blank, you're dealing with a mental illness which means they can't ever see it. And even if they can see it, if they're untreated, they do not have, literally do not have the ability to take that awareness and put it into some kind of mechanism that gives traction on the ground that goes forward to create a different life. My, the, the girl I was with, she went through uh, some kind of, you know, she has other kinds of stuff I think going on. I don't know all how it all fits together. But she, I think because of being with me, because the intimacy that she was, and to her credit, I got to say, she tried. Uh, there, she didn't have it in for me. She wanted, she wanted it. I know she did. That's what was so sad. And why it hurt so bad, because I knew that when she went and decided that I was out to get her, um, I knew that that person really, really wanted to love me and be loved by me. She really did. She's, she's not evil. She has a mental illness. She can't help it. But that, 
the fact that she can't help it doesn't take away from the fact that it's impossible to be in the midst of that poison of that mental illness and not get destroyed. It's not possible. Somebody's got, you know, COVID and they're in a 10 by 10 room and they're breathing. It's not possible for you to walk in there without, you know, a space helmet on and breathe their air without getting it. It's impossible. You're going to, you're going to catch it. And, um, so, um, but you have to create boundaries. When you create boundaries, they will not like it at all. And they will work hard to get you to change your mind and take those boundaries down. They will uh, manipulate, they will sidestep, they will negotiate, they will do, they will shame, they will bludgeon you, they will do whatever the hell they they won't they won't be able to help it. And the reason for that is, let me use my favorite teaching tool here, because as a borderline, if in fact they have a severe mental illness of borderline personality disorder, it means that when they were this age or probably younger, uh, they were uh, discarded, abandoned, devalued, abused, uh, in such a way that they never, ever got their first initial needs met. Can you get that? This is, I don't know if this is true or not. I'm going by what I've been, been what I've uh, found by reading from experts who say this is how it happens. And it totally makes sense to me and I believe it. But this knowledge is what helps me separate and go, wow, I can't get involved. I can't, even if I want to. There's no mechanism for me to interact with that. That little baby didn't even get the first, uh, um, you know, the first need when she was a month or two months old and had a need. That need never got met which means that things in the brain never connected, which means things in the psyche never connected, which means spiritually, the spirit never could connect with the body. I believe that. I believe that their spirit is over here and their body and brain is over here. And they feel such a spiritual disconnect. I mean, this is just me talking. I can't prove that. But I have to see it that way because if I don't, then the only place for me to go is, how could she possibly do that to me? I did nothing but love her. I've loved her, gave more to her than I did anybody in my entire life. And she then turned around and found the worst possible way to devalue, destroy, discard, betray, and hurt me more deeply on the most deep, intimate level than anybody ever has, including my alcoholic father and dysfunctional mother and abusive brother and all the exes that I've had. Nobody ever got to me that deep and said, here's the thing you need the most and I crush it in your face. Nobody's ever done that. And that's because, again, borderlines are the epitome of projection. If you don't know what psychological projection is, they and they've perfected it. They've perfected projection. Nobody, no other person, no matter how sick, no matter how messed up, can perfect projection as well because there's a part of them that knows it's not true. But when borderlines get the feeling, and that's their experience, is that the feeling overcomes them, that you are doing it to them. And it's not just like you're doing it to them. It's that you are trying to kill them. Now, I remember a long time ago, there was a movie. I can't even remember what it was. I think it was a, you know, this was way back in the 80s. And it was a, a documentary about um, recovery, you know, hospital recovery for addiction and overeating. And they were lumping it all together. And there was this really overweight guy who obviously, oh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm led to believe he had an eating disorder. And he's in the hospital and he was big. He was like six foot. He must have been 300 pounds. And he was screaming at the top of his lungs to uh, somebody, a counselor or a, uh, a, an orderly or somebody. But he was towering over somebody and he was saying, you're trying to kill me. And of course, you look at it and you see how overweight you know, no, it was, you're trying to starve me to death. That's what it was. He was screaming, you're trying to starve me to death. I need to eat. And um, that, that is the experience when borderlines who are intolerant cannot process intimacy when they experience intimacy, even if it's just inside their brain, you didn't do anything. You're walking down the street. You're on your way to go have lunch. You're driving in a car. You, whatever it is, there's something about it that stimulates them that, that reveals intimacy. Some, you know, the, you know, times when you're in your car with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and then there's this feeling that comes over you of, I'm with the person I love. And maybe it happens on an unconscious level. It could just be that. It could be nothing you did. You could be, you know, thinking about, you know, what you're going to eat at the at the breakfast hut. And they have a feeling which stimulates a feeling of intimacy. I'm convinced this is what it is, which then takes them back to the original um, unfulfilled need for intimacy that never, ever, ever got uh, fulfilled and then this happens to them and they look at you they have an adult brain which comes up with all kinds of reasons because all they know is they feel this and the cause of it is you because they need you more than anything else in the universe you your love because you're their parent they don't see you as an adult they see you as as not just a parent but they see you the way this little baby sees her parent and the parent is choking them to death. There's, they have no rational reason for it. They can't even come up with a rational reason for it. But that feeling will force them to find something, anything. And that's why you looked at them wrong. You said the wrong thing. You didn't answer the phone. Whatever the hell it is, it's because they actually have this feeling of love and intimacy that creates this cycle of, pain and rejection and they can't they can't get out of it they have no it's a mental illness because there's no rationale to it so you have to set boundaries and when you set boundaries that will set this off and then they will try to get you to take the boundaries down you know why they they can't handle boundaries because do you think this little girl has boundaries in order for her to survive, she has to have no boundaries. Because with her, she has a mommy and maybe a daddy who sees her naked, who wipes her behind, who, who feeds her, who talks to her, who, who puts her clothes on, who puts her to sleep, who does everything for her. In order for her to survive, she can't have any boundaries whatsoever. So when you tell a borderline that, that, and you lay down a boundary, that would be like walking up to this little girl who's completely dependent upon you for her not only emotional but physical survival and saying, um, listen, I'm not going to cook you food anymore. Um, it's up in the cupboard right there. And you're going to have to go and wash yourself and brush your teeth and, you know, because I got to go. I can't take care of you. You know, I got a life. So you got to take care of yourself. What the hell is that little baby going to do? She can't even reach the, the counter. She can't even, maybe she doesn't even know what the hell a counter is. She doesn't have any ability to make her own food. She can't wipe her own ass. She can't love herself. She can't do anything. That's what happens when you lay down a boundary. That's why you feel so guilty. Because it would be like saying, to, because on an unconscious level, you know on an unconscious level, you know it's just an infant that can't take care of itself. And that's why 
you feel so guilty when you lay down a boundary and she does this. You do it would be like if you said to a child, go make your own food. And then the child started to cry. You would go, oh my God, what am I doing? And you would pick the child up and you would say, of course I'm going to make your food. I'm so sorry. Daddy's having a bad day. Mommy's having a bad day. And that's what you do with the borderline. You say, I can't handle this anymore. I can't, you know, you have got to go get therapy, meaning you've got to be responsible for your own feelings and your own reactions. And boing, this happens. Wow, wow, wow. What are you going to do? Of course you feel like, of course you feel guilty. Of course you feel like you're going insane. How do you tell this little baby you can't take care of her? Making me sad. It's awful. It's horrible. So sad. But they aren't this. They just think they are. And I assume that's what a real therapist would do is to is to meet them there and say, yes, you feel this and this happened to you and you were never taken care of. And your first initial need for love never was met and you've been broken ever since. We can give you medication or we can teach you how to do that. When you have this feeling, you have to remember this and you have to take this action or tell yourself this. I'll share this with everybody. I'm sure this is helpful even for borderlines. There's something that the EFT guys do. You know, the guys that do the tapping and the, 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 the whatever the hell that is. I mean, I've tried that. They have a motto. You can call it a mantra if you want. And they say, even though I have this feeling, I thoroughly and completely accept myself. And I think uh, if when you see that in your borderline partner and you lay down the boundary and that little baby is crying and you can't fix her, you can't take care of her. Uh, you have to tell yourself, even though I have this feeling that I want to take care of her and I want to throw my boundaries away and I want to take it on and make all her boo-boos go away, even though I have this feeling, I thoroughly and completely accept myself, which means I can't and I'm not going to take action on that feeling. And I assume borderlines can say the same thing when they're flipping out and they want to, they want to, uh, you know, they want to split and they want to uh, devalue and they want to destroy the connection. If they can say to themselves as they're feeling this, if they can say to themselves, even though I have this feeling, I thoroughly and completely accept myself. Which is really, the reason why that works so well is because that's what a parent does. A real parent, when this is happening, picks you up and says, it's okay, I'm here. A, a real parent, when you come home, you know, and the kids have, this happened to me. You know, I'm nobody messes with me now. I'm 200 pounds. I'm a martial arts expert. And, you know, you can tell if I wanted to be intimidating, I can't. Nobody messes with me now. But I was the shortest kid in school when I was a kid. And I got bullied. I had an older brother that used to bully me. And I got picked on a lot. And uh, I remember coming home, and to my dad's credit, I remember coming home, and I was very sad, and I got... He actually, actually, what ended up happening is I turned into a very good fighter. I ended up being able to beat up the bigger, older kids when they'd pick on me. But it was really sad. It would just, you know, it was sad to be called shorty and pushed around and, you know, the stuff that kids do. And I remember coming home and talking about it and all the kids were getting, you know, they were going through puberty and I hadn't hit puberty yet and they were getting big and making fun of me. And, and I remember saying how sad I was and, and my dad, to his credit, you know, he, he did some things right. He did. He sat me down and he said, uh, you know, something to the effect of, you know, you can't, you can't let them and their feelings uh, affect you. You know, you know who you are. That's what parents do. So maybe that's why I'm not borderline. Maybe my parents did just enough. I'm still codependent, but they did just enough to meet that need, which this little baby never got. And that's what a real parent does. When, when that little baby is crying, the parent says, it's okay for you to have that feeling. 
And then the child learns, oh, I'm having a feeling and it's okay. I can still act this and I can still do this even though I have this feeling. This baby has no clue that she can't do anything other than what her impulses are driving her to do, which is to scream cry. She doesn't have any other experience or any, any, any buffer between that impulse because she was never given that. Parents have to give that or the neurons and everything doesn't come together. And when you're older and you come home and your first boyfriend, uh, you know, uh, cheats on you at the prom and, and goes off with the other, you know, the new girl who will kiss him better. And he, he leaves you there in your prom dress and says, I'm going to go home, go to the hotel with her. I don't want you anymore. And you go home crying, right? You're a real parent says that's awful. And I'm so sorry you're feeling that way. And it's okay. You'll get over it. And, but I love you and you have every right to have that feeling. I'm here for you. Or you were that girl and you went home and your dad, drinking and smoking, says, shut the hell up and get me a beer. Get over it. Grow up. You know, that was one of the first things that was said to me here on this channel by Borderlands. When I was, you know, if you look at my first videos where I'm, just a wreck. And that was one of the first things. Obviously, borderlines, they don't want to hear, you know, if they're untreated, they don't want to be told that they're abusive and hurtful and whatever else, whatever else they may take from that. And, you know, one of them said, why don't you just throw yourself in front of the bus and get it over with? Now, of course, that didn't bother me, but that's that same abuse. That's the same abuse that person must have had. But at this age, can you imagine? It's awful. So again, this isn't about feeling sorry for borderlines. This is about um, uh, this is about codependence realizing there's not a damn thing they can do to meet that baby's need. The time for that baby getting their needs met has come and gone, and the only thing you can do is get the hell out of the way. And when this baby realizes that they have to find some way to find some healing and get some therapy and when they own it and they realize that they have a mental illness that's causing them and everybody around them damage and until they're willing to own that and do the work there is not a fucking thing in this universe you can do for them and if you try they will destroy you and I thoroughly believe that you can end up if you spend a long enough time being devalued by them, you can become one. I thoroughly believe that. And I don't say that about any other disease out there, like mental illness, or, you know, I don't say that about alcoholism or drug addiction or other things, but this, it is the king, in my experience anyway, it's the king of all mental illnesses. It is the devil. The only thing you can do is stay away. So the kindest thing you can do for your borderline is to say, I love you, but this relationship is toxic to me. And for my own health, I have to leave and go no contact. If you want to have me in your life, then um, I will need you to go on your own to, ther to find a therapist who deals with borderline personality disorder for a year regularly. If after that time, you want to contact me, I would be happy to come and meet with you in your therapist office and see where we can go from there. And you and I both know that the, the likelihood of that is virtually impossible. Uh, but that way, if you want to keep them in your life, you'll give them that option. You can set that boundary if you want. If you want recovery from your codependence, it's a three-pronged approach. If my experience is what will work for you. If not, you're welcome to find whatever works for you. I only know what worked for me. What has worked for me is, number one, therapy with a qualified therapist. Number two, 12-step group. I recommend Codependence Anonymous. Al-Anon will work. Adult Children of Alcoholics. You know, those, but, you know, something that has to do primarily with codependence. 
work the 12 steps with a sponsor, forget about all the sick people in there and all the stuff they're doing. Go and find somebody who's worked the steps and say, will you walk me through the steps? I think I might be uh, codependent. And don't worry about it if somebody says the word God. You can, you know, the point is, is that you're a codependent and you need to have something that's, you know, that's not you. And if you want to make that the blimp or a, a doorknob or the ocean, I don't care. But, it, you know, your best thinking got you here. So you better find another force to get you to another place. Third pronged approach is a spiritual approach, which is, I don't care what it is, meditation, yoga, tai chi, uh, walking in the woods and talking to the animals, shamanism. There has to be some connection to some force and some practice that helps some discipline because it's good for the brain, creates new patterns in the brain. Discipline creates new patterns in the brain. Doing the opposite, uh, learning how to take contrary action consistently puts new connections in the brain. Um, those, that's the three-pronged approach that worked for me, and that's what I recommend uh, for you as well. That's it. All right. Uh, the tiny baby over here is crying because you have not subscribed. If you want her to stop crying, then gently mouse over her little face and click subscribe and she will be very happy and be cured forever. All right, that's it. Talk to you guys later.